Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to um, tranche two of the Volunteer Research Paper Initiative. I'm Mark Pierce. I'm the CEO of Volunteering Australia. It's a pleasure to be joining you this afternoon and for you to join us. We um, have a pretty full schedule, so um, I, won't, uh, I won't muck around. Um, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands that I'm on. I'm in our nation's capital on uh, Ngunnawal country, and I pay my respects to elders past and present, uh, extend those respects to traditional custodians of the lands that you all are on today, and further extend my respects to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who may well be joining us today. I like to reflect upon the fact that um, as we talk about volunteering, as we talk about community participation, building the opportunity for stronger and more inclusive communities. It's something that's been taking place on this continent for over 60,000 years when we're one small part of that extensive and valuable tradition. So for the uh, for the schedule itself today, I'll be um, handing to uh, Melanie Oppenheimer, um, who is the chair of the research working group for the National uh, Strategy for Volunteering, um, who will introduce the initiative itself. We'll then hear from eight presenters. We have eight presenters today, which is exciting. Everyone has three minutes each, and I'm going to be pretty brutal. Um, I have my stopwatch in front of me, um, and uh, uh, you'll forgive me if I uh, cut you off midstream, um, but uh, three minutes per presenter. We'll jump into a little bit of Q&A at the end, um, and uh, please feel free to use the chat function if you want to direct to a particular speaker, uh, make mention of that. Alternatively, just raise your hand um, and I will call upon you. Um, we'll then wrap up um, and uh, we'll uh, we'll make the papers live. So um, perhaps to that end, um, I might uh, take this opportunity. Oh, I should also say we put everyone on mute um, just because it's easier for us to do that. And uh, I might uh, hand over to Melanie Oppenheimer uh, just to introduce the Volunteer Research Paper Initiative. Melanie. Thank you very much, Mark, and hello, everybody. Um, as the chair of the research working group, um, which was formed at the beginning of the year, a practical way for academics and researchers to inform the National Strategy for Volunteering. A group of us from around Australia have been working through the year on a number of projects, including this particular one, the Volunteering Research Papers Initiative. Now, the primary purpose of the initiative was to provide a range of insights and evidence that would help inform the National Strategy Project. And it was premised around the idea that what was needed was a number of high level topics relating to a range of volunteering issues and based around rigorous research evidence. We originally, we had an original list of about 14 um, ideas or topics that we thought were relevant to the design of the National Strategy for Volunteering, but we were open to all ideas. So we only had a limited time to get this process underway and it involved an expression of interest. Um, the expressions of interest were reviewed by an editorial board, which was made up of a subgroup of people from the research working group. The selected authors were then asked to submit 3,000 word papers. After that, they were peer reviewed by two anonymous reviewers, and this is a standard practice um, in the academy, and then publication has occurred in three stages. So we had, I don't know how many of you managed to join us for the first successful launch on Tuesday, the 27th of September. We had um, seven papers and these papers were launched, have been launched in no particular order. It's just as the papers were ready, um, we have then uh, released them. So today we have our second group of papers, eight fascinating topics, um, and there'll be a final group of papers uh, presented early in the new year before the launch of the strategy in February. So thank you all very much for joining us and I'll hand back to Mark now to facilitate the author presentations. Wonderful, thanks so much, Melanie. Okay, uh, the clock starts and uh, we will be jumping in to, uh, the, um, to each of the presenters. Um, as I said, everyone has three minutes um, and uh, we'll be starting with, uh, with Megan Woods. Um, Jack's just going to put up on the screen a, uh, an intro slide for each presenter, I understand. Um, Megan is from the University of Tasmania. Um, and Megan, I will uh, throw to you if I may. Thank you, Mark. Um, 
thank you, Mark. Um, well, good afternoon, everyone. This paper was inspired by the Volunteering Australia submission to the National Mental Health Workforce Strategy, from which I learned a really fascinating thing. We have no idea how large the volunteer workforce is that supports mental health services in this country. There is no official data about this at all. And as someone with a disciplinary background in human resource management and workforce development, and a particular research interest in workplace mental health and care workforces, I found this absolutely astonishing. So I started exploring ways in which we could potentially answer two questions. How could we determine the size, scale and contributions of volunteer workforces that support particular kinds of community services, such as mental health services? And how could we determine more accurately the true size of a workforce that involves both paid and volunteer workers? So the paper really details some of the different approaches that I've uh, identified and also some of the challenges that would come from trying to progress work in this area. One, arguably the most common, is to survey volunteers themselves and ask them how much volunteering they do and what sorts of volunteer work they do. That is useful for giving us an idea of the size of the overall volunteer labour force, say at a population level, but it's very limited in terms of its capacity for us to then drill down and determine the size of specific volunteer workforces, what volunteers in those workforces actually do, and how those contributions might compare to those of paid workers. The other approach, which I've actually ended up advocating for, is that we take an approach more like that used in the aged care workforce census, where we actually collect um, data from volunteer involving organisations about how much volunteer labour they use, what they use it for, uh, what kinds of roles and contributions volunteers perform and contribute. I also detail in the paper um, how we could conduct a census like that in ways that address the 2021 recommendations of the International Labour Organisation about collecting data on volunteer workforces so that we can build more comparable data sets, both nationally and internationally. If we were able to do this, then the policy and practice implications are pretty exciting, actually. Um, for a start, it would mean that we could more accurately calculate the true size of workforces that actually support service provision by volunteering involving organisations, which would also then help us calculate more accurately the replacement cost of volunteer contributions and therefore the economic value of volunteer contributions. But it would also give us more understanding of how volunteers contribute to the overall service provision, and especially ways in which we could improve advocacy for the inclusion of volunteers in workforce-related strategies and initiatives. Thanks for listening. Please get in touch if you'd like to know more. Thanks, Megan. That was spot on. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Um, I will throw now to um, Melanie Oppenheimer. Melanie, please. Thank you, Mark. The new national strategy for volunteering provides us with an opportunity to reimagine the role of volunteering in Australia. As a historian, I believe that by examining our volunteer history, we can better explain the phenomenon of volunteering generally and provide tools to help us understand this important aspect of Australian life, both now and into the future. So our paper is framed around seven historical themes in chronological order that make up what we call the Australian way of volunteering. This concept, um, an Australian way of volunteering, includes the following ideas, that there is a distinct but evolving relationship, what is called a moving frontier, between governments, civil society and volunteers in Australia. Secondly, that Australia's unique geography and climate pay, play an integral role in how we volunteer, why we volunteer. Australia's particular model of federalism prevents, uh, is also critical in terms of how our volunteering infrastructure um, has evolved and how we volunteer today. And the ever-changing diversity and multicultural nature of Australian, Australia as a country with First Nations as the bedrock, and then many layers of migration on top of that. So we, we have six insights overall, um, and I'll just mention two of them today. Firstly is this bedrock, the, the, the community and 
volunteering by First Nations people has been a core feature of their everyday life for tens of thousands of years. Now, these long-standing Indigenous forms of volunteering constitute a unique form of social capital in Australian society, and they deserve full recognition, even if um, Indigenous peoples and First Nations don't maybe see themselves as volunteers themselves, um, what, what their practices and their work infuse our volunteering practices. And secondly, the relationship between governments, civil society and volunteers has been fundamentally shaped by Australia's past as a penal colony established by the British in 1788. This was a government enterprise with, with uh, jailers and, and convicts. And this has played an integral part in how we have evolved. Um, this has shifted over the time and the role of governments in encouraging and supporting volunteering has been ambiguous as well. So greater, greater clarity around the roles of all levels of government should be an aspiration of the new national strategy on volunteering. And in terms of policy, I'd suggest people go back to the 1970s, go back to the period, the era of Gough Whitlam and have a look, have another look at the Australian assistance plan, because I think there, there you might find some new ways of volunteering into the future. Thank you. Thanks so much, Melanie. Um, if I could now throw to Irit Alani, please. Irit. Thank you, Mark. Um, so thanks everyone for this opportunity. Our um, paper looks at online volunteering, which is um, volunteering, giving your own time freely voluntarily, but using the internet for at least some of it. And the reason we looked at online volunteering is that um, it's, it's kind of an innovative way that not only is cool, but it's allowing um, to expand that um, the pool of volunteers that organizations can draw from. So it allows uh, for people to volunteer remotely. Um, it allows inclusion of people with a disability. It reduces the threshold of actually getting there and volunteering. Um, there's um, talk about it including allowing for inclusion of people from the LGBT um, QAI community. So, so it's a it's a cool thing to do. And we looked at um, what the literature has already told us about um, online volunteering and why people do it, what kind of motivations there are um, that bring people to do it. And for that, one of the frameworks we had to look at is the um, volunteer function inventory, <clears throat> which talks about six functions that volunteering plays in people's lives when they, um, when they come to volunteer. And we found, um, sorry, I'll talk about what we found in a minute, but we found that basically they're the same for online volunteering. So people volunteer online for the same reasons. Um, and we had a look in our research at um, a very successful online volunteering organization, the Australian Museum. So it's a world benchmark, world leading um, online volunteering program, which um, consults to the Smithsonian and other organizations um, <clears throat> and has, um, tens of thousands of volunteers registered online, but not that many that volunteer in practice. So this was a great um, audience to look for the differences between those who actually volunteer and those who don't to try and find what's, what's making people volunteer um, online and how to support that better. And what we found was that um, online volunteering can be greatly supported if the training and the support online are um, provided to, um, to volunteers throughout the whole process from start to finish. We also found um, that the reach to volunteers is something that can be done online. So platforms like Seek um, or um, United Nations volunteering, platforms like that can reach um, to, to potential volunteers. And we also found that meaning and impact are important to volunteers. They need to feel like what they're doing is impactful and meaningful. So um, our paper presents a few other things in this, in this space, which I won't go into right now, um, but let us know if you need to hear any more about it. Hey, Reed, thank you so much. Thank Appreciate you. it. Uh, if I could throw to you, Adam, Adam Nebs. Thanks, Mark. Um, hello, everyone. I just want to give a bit of background. Uh, my area of research is actually psychological health and safety at work. Um, for anyone following it, this domain has been evolving quite a lot over the past 10 years, 
but we really don't know a lot about psychological health and safety in volunteering roles. So that really prompted me to, to do a bit of a review of the current research landscape. So a few things to consider. Um, firstly, is that volunteering roles provide important mental health and wellbeing outcomes for individuals. Um, there really is no shortage of research out there that tells us that, particularly uh, research that's been done on the, the older demographic. However, um, volunteer roles may not be without hazards to psychological health and safety and, and those undertaking those roles. What we call this in the job literature, and, um, and we haven't yet uh, amended this to be, uh, you know, a, a volunteering language, we call this in the job literature psychosocial hazards. And these come out of the intersection between specific roles, the individuals undertaking those roles, and those they're socialising with in a, a volunteering context. And the research uh, on psychosocial hazards in volunteer roles is, is seriously lacking. Um, in my review, I did find some research that does discuss these hazards implicitly. Um, the most common hazard is what we call high job demands. And really how that looks in a volunteering context would be where a volunteer may have a large amount of work to do in their role but lack the resources to do it. So why this is really important is that uh, obviously, we know that volunteering uh, is going to have good mental health outcomes for individuals, but we don't yet understand, you know, what is the context of those roles uh, and how can we make them more safe? So Safe Work Australia has currently updated the uh, work health and safety regulations to include the management of psychosocial hazards, and that does extend to volunteer involving organisations. However, volunteering organisations that are completely comprised of volunteers, and we call these commonly volunteer associations, like your local sports clubs, they're not actually covered, uh, covered under this legislation. And although we have guidance documents available uh, that can you know, guide volunteers and their organisations through the process of identifying these hazards, uh, there needs to be more aware, awareness raising because uh, quite often the volunteers are focused on the work itself uh, and don't have time to look at these, these guidance documents. Um, but ultimately, the, the biggest, most at-risk organisations are those in regional communities. I'm currently working with Volunteering Tasmania in some regional communities here, and you can see the challenges firsthand. Um, these communities lack allied health professionals, primary health care, mental health practitioners in general. Uh, and if we add to the fact that these communities have a lack of digital infrastructure and low digital literacy, um, you can see how it's very difficult for them to access these guidance materials. So this paper is about a call to action uh, to help fund local government associations, councils and organisations so they can get these resources. Thank you. Wonderful. Thanks, Adam. Um, Megan Paul, good morning to you. Coming from the West, I'll hand over to you. Good morning. Thank you. Um, I'm on Noongar Buja and would just like to pay my respects to the elders past and present over here in Western Australia. As someone who first presented at a volunteering conference in 1994, I've tried to keep up with the volume of uh, volunteering research in Australia over all of that time, but it's not easy. And uh, so my paper is actually about a scan of the volunteering research in Australia and about Australia since IYV plus 10 or the International Year of Volunteers plus 10, which is 2011. The searching process uh, revealed lots and lots and lots of research. And in fact, the volume um, is amazing. So um, the initial searching led to 200 journal articles between 2011 and May 2022, um, and then reverse searching an additional 100. That was 20 articles in 2011 um, and uh, right the way through to 40 in 2021. 185 different academic journals with the greatest number of articles published in Third Sector Review, followed by Voluntas. There were 670 individuals and about a dozen teams that were identified and all but two of the 43 universities in Australia represented by affiliation shown by the authors. And there are collaborating universities from all over the world. It was easy to identify volunteering specialists because their names were um, apparent all the way throughout, but we also have discipline-based volunteering specialists and visiting discipline experts who come into the volunteering area uh, in relation to their particular area. Funding is actually quite hard to track. It's only in recent times that journals have required that this be put up and um, not all of the reports include it either. Uh, the other thing is that sometimes uh, the anonymity of partnering organisations means that we don't know uh, where the funding is coming from. But a question arises as to whether we should be proud that quality uh, research emerges despite what appears to be a paucity in funding, 
or critical of that paucity of funding, I think perhaps both. Uh, I also found that volunteering research is keeping pace with methodological advancements. We've got mixed methods approaches and innovative data gathering techniques being seen alongside the more traditional approaches. And we're beginning to see a lot of co-design with the communities that are being researched. I'm not going to try and list all the themes, we just don't have time. But there's there are gaps that include a need to widen our scope and broaden our understanding, including we still don't necessarily all agree on what the definition should be. And I think it's time to be bold in asking difficult questions about volunteering, including whether traditional approaches are still relevant and possibly about the dark legacies of past practices. We've got lots of opportunity to bring new voices into the discussion, about, uh, including about different perspectives on volunteers and volunteering. And we really do need to continue to explore the new forms of volunteering and new vehicles for volunteering. Even in the new, more traditional forms of volunteering, it's time to explore new ways of thinking. And we do need to make sure that we're looking at volunteer managers and not just managing volunteers. Dissemination and accessibility of findings and sharing of outcomes needs attention with the principles associated with open access and data repositories and so on being important. And we are moving into that space. So to conclude, the volume of research is great news. We need to make sure we're doing things to ensure the continuity of the quality of volunteering research. And we need to move into a space where wide dissemination means that we're getting the best value from what's produced. And we do need to be bold about the questions which are being asked. Megan, thank you. Apologies again for the technical difficulty, but you forged on. Um, it is entire, indeed time to be bold, and I think that the National Strategy for Volunteering picks up on that sentiment and hopefully provides us with a, uh, a bold path forward. Uh, thanks, Megan. Um, Suihun Cha, I will ask you to step up. Thank you. Hi there. Uh, I'm a professor of behavioural economics at UTAS and also the director of the Tasmanian Behavioural Lab. So in this paper, I apply a behavioural economics lens to volunteering. So what is behavioural economics? It is the branch of economics which um, incorporates insights from psychology to understand why people do what they do, why they behave the way they do. As a behavioural economist, uh, I, I believe that an understanding of the psychology that underlies people's behaviour will allow us to design more effective solutions to encourage a desired behaviour. So why is this relevant to volunteering? Because volunteering is an activity which is rooted in human behaviour. As individuals, people choose whether or not to volunteer. So if we understand the psychology behind their volunteering, we can design solutions appealing to that psychology to more effectively encourage them to volunteer. So what is the psychology that underlies volunteering then? Um, so far, there's been very little work applying behavioral insights to volunteering. So what I've done in this paper is to draw upon the wider literature in charitable giving, to address this gap. So some of the psychological factors that I found that, uh, that drive people's charitable behavior include their emotions, the mental shortcuts that they use to make these choices due to cognitive and information overload, and their propensity to adhere to social norms. I believe these apply to volunteering as well, as um, they actually share an underlying civic core, and there's lots of evidence that show that there is a positive relationship between the two. So what are some of the recommended solutions? So um, if you read the paper, I use a framework called the EAST framework, and this was developed by the Behavior Insights team. So if you want to encourage a behavior, you make it easy, you make it attractive, you make it social, you make it timely. So to encourage volunteering, make it easy, attractive, social, timely. So in the paper, I talk about more solutions, but for instance, making it easy addresses the barriers to volunteering that result from cognitive overload. So many potential volunteers, they report being overwhelmed by too many different options. So a solution would be to provide them with a smaller number of default choices. Making it attractive is because many decisions we make automatically in the moment, so we can appeal to people's emotions in recruitment campaigns. So, for example, we focus on one specific identifiable beneficiary and we weave the narrative around that. I won't talk about uh, the others, but before I go, just two things I'd like to point out. There are many things, many reasons why people volunteer or not. I'm not just looking at the behavioral ones. And two, all solutions need to be tested before they are rolled out for unintended consequences. So um, I hope you enjoyed the paper and uh, you know, look forward to any questions. Sweet home, thank you so much.
Um, Tracy Dixon, um, I will throw to you if I may. Thanks, Mark. I hope you can uh, hear me. Sorry for the uh, sorry for the mucking about. Um, I'm in the car doing this, so <laughs> it's a bit of a challenge. Um, it's interesting listening to this, as we're hearing just then in terms of making it easy and um, attractive for volunteers. So Professor Darcy and I have done a heap of volunteer, uh, research on volunteers and their motivations for volunteering for mega sport events like the Olympics and Paralympics. And uh, we're interested in the legacy, legacy side of it particularly because many of these events suggest that because of these events, there's going to be a, a legacy of volunteering in the community afterwards. Basically, from what we've seen, not so. <laughs> so, But we have seen one case where it happened, and that was Whistler Adaptive, uh, snow sports in, uh, obviously, Whistler, BC. And one of the key differences for them was they were one of about 30 organisations we spoke to who had a plan before the games of how to get involved, how to get their volunteers involved and how to keep them afterwards. And so, you know, we're focused particularly on uh, the areas of surviving the, the suite of uh, mega sport events we've got coming up in the next 10 years, you know, such as the Commonwealth Games, FIFA Women's World Cup uh, and the Olympic and Paralympics is expect that if you are an organisation that uses volunteers, that your volunteers will be wanting to be involved in these events because about 70 or 80% of mega sport event volunteers are volunteering in sports, culture, welfare, education, you name it, they're engaged. Typically, though, they don't want to volunteer more afterwards. And so if you're expecting that there'll be a legacy uh, that will just turn up in your doorstep, it won't happen. You need to go out there. You need to, you know, use what Sue here and just just talked about in terms of making it easy, accessible, interesting. You know, you need to invite them in. You need to find out what they're they're interested in. Particularly the ones who are least likely to, oh, sorry, most likely to volunteer more or want to volunteer more after the games, are the under twenty five year olds who aren't already volunteering. So they are the ones that won't have that volunteering culture. They won't have that volunteering experience. And so it's going to take more to train them, you know, recruit them, train them and keep them because they're much more uh, transactional. They're after what's in it for me. Am I going to get job contacts? I'm going to get job skills. They're less altruistic than your older volunteers. The other thing to keep in mind that the main person who volunteers for mega sport events is an older woman. And we know that we save the world. So hopefully, though, my paper can, our paper can uh, help you think about some things to do with the mega sport events, how you can survive them, how you can thrive beyond them, and that we maintain and grow our volunteering culture. Thanks for listening. Thanks so much, Tracy. Um, Blythe McLennan, far from least, but certainly last on the list. Um, over to you. Thanks, Mark, and hello, everyone. So this is a paper that's from a single research study that aimed to support volunteer-involving organisations in the emergency management sector to put themselves in the best position possible to enable and sustain the value that volunteering has for communities before, during and after emergencies and to do that over the next decade. The idea behind the project was to generate insights about how the future of this volunteering could be different to the way it is today. Um, and then to develop resources to assist volunteer involvement organisations in the emergency management sector to consider those insights, to adapt them to their own particular context, and then to use them to inform their volunteer workforce planning and their community engagement. And a central component of those resources are future scenarios, for future scenarios for emergency volunteering in Australia that are described in the paper. So insights about how the future can be different from the way it is today, how things are today, is called foresight. And it's very important for longer range strategic planning in particular. And when you use foresight thinking, you don't just consider one idea of what you think or expect the future to look like, because you understand that there's a lot of uncertainty about how the future might unfold. And so you consider multiple plausible future scenarios that represent what might happen in the future rather than using a more linear planning approach that's just preparing you for one 
one possible outcome. And the benefit of this is that you can stress test policies and plans and strategies against different scenarios and adapt them to be more robust to what might unfold in coming years. And foresight's most valuable when it's ongoing. So what we know and what we expect about the future changes over time as um, context around us changes and our expectations change. And so doing foresight activities regularly helps organisations to be aware of and be responsive to shifts in the external environment around them and also in their own expectations about the future and how that's shaping their planning and then to adapt their programs accordingly to make them more future proof and that doesn't have to be a really complicated process it can be as simple as a workshop or even just a periodic team discussion um, so there's some information in the paper about how the insights were generated um, and and what some of them are uh, but they represent the collective experience and views and expectations of over 200 people that are involved in supporting volunteering in the emergency management sector, and that's a wide range of volunteering. And, of course, those views are going to change over time. So the resources, what they capture is a snapshot in time view of the future that volunteering organisations can use to stimulate their own foresight thinking. The resources that were developed have been compiled into a single document, so they include future scenarios, a catalogue of potential drivers of change and how certain or how, how much agreement there is about how they will unfold um, and some information about foresight and some examples from people of the kinds of things we need to do to um, shift toward the more preferred future where there is vibrant, impactful, well-supported, sustainable volunteering. Um, they're available for me. Um, directly by email, so welcome to email me for them, and they'll also be up publicly soon on the Bushfire Natural Hazards Cooperative Research Centre webpage. And so while the resources were prepared um, with volunteer involving organisations and emergency management in mind, they have a lot of uh, relevance to other volunteer involving organisations. A lot of the factors included are shared beyond emergency management, um, and so they're relevant for other organisations and other clients of volunteering as well. Um, so please yeah, reach out if you'd like to get a copy of those or hear a little bit more about what's available in those resources. Thank you. No, thank you so much. Uh, researchers, one and all, thank you so much. The uh, papers are fascinating and I would certainly encourage everyone to jump onto the uh, National Strategy for Volunteering website. Um, papers are live, as, been, as has been suggested in the chat um, and uh, download them, take a look. There's some fascinating reading. So we have 15 minutes or so for a bit of Q&A. Um, I encourage you to uh, either put your questions into the, the chat. Um, as I mentioned at the outset, if you are directing a question to a particular researcher, uh, feel free to put the name in there. Um, otherwise, raise your hand and hopefully I'll be able to see your virtual raised hand and call upon you. Uh, unmute you and you can ask the question. Um, so whilst we uh, wait for the hands to go up, I might ask uh, Jack McDermott um, to uh, to tell me if we've got any questions in the in the chat. Thanks, Mark. It looks like we've still got um, some questions kind of coming through. Uh, we did have one comment that I thought could be interesting to get um, some sort of answer on. I think. Um, from Joni in the chat, which was um, they were interested to hear how the national digital divide um, impacts online volunteering. I think this was in response to Irid's presentation. Um, Irid, I wonder if you uh, had any uh, found anything on that in your research. Yeah, in our research, we haven't because obviously we our um, population was people who volunteer and not people who don't. And those would be the ones um, affected by the digital divide. There is literature on um, the threshold for people who are um, not digitally lit literate. It's The research on that is actually very, very scarce and it's very obvious. Like people don't volunteer online if they don't have access to the Internet. OK, big surprise. Um, but, you know, and you'd say, oh, maybe they could go to a library or something, but they're probably not inclined. What I see there is an opportunity. I see platforms that know how to engage people in online volunteering and organizations that know how to bring people on board that can be um, recruited to address this digital divide. So that would definitely be an interesting research to look into in the future. Yeah. 
Yeah, sorry, I don't have any anything further. Jack, back to you. Um, I don't know if we have any other questions at the moment. Uh, please feel free, uh, anyone, if you're, you know, if you don't feel like raising your hand, put a question in the chat. Um, I'll direct these to a researcher or just to the panel, um, and we can get some uh, good discussion going that way. Oh, we do have a question here from uh, Todd. What type of activities are most popular or useful with online volunteering? Um, that will be to a Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Todd. Um, let me just bring this up. So we see a few types of um, online volunteering. We see citizen science. So there's um, strong em emphasis on civil engagement in citizen science. So people counting frogs or counting birds and, you know, uploading that or citizen science in terms of like floods. And that's that's going to be quite an, um, a growing area in the emergency um, space. Mental health support. So there was talk about mental health before, and that's a very common space. Not so much in Australia, but in other countries, there's a lot of online um, volunteering for that space. Um, consulting. So the UN will have their own grant writing, but there's also other organizations that will ask people to come and, you know, write grants or things like that that can happen online. And the organization that we studied, um, the Australian Museum, they have a phenomenal um, volunteering group or volunteering crowd, I should say, um, where they um, combine. It's a hybrid version, but they have on-site volunteers and online volunteers, and they digitize the entire collection of the museum. So every item that the museum has, any beetle or, you know, um, any specimen also has a note that comes with it with a written, um, usually handwritten from, you know, um, decades ago, the details of that specimen. So the on-site volunteers will take photos of the, um, the object and the note and upload that. And then the online volunteers will transcribe and experienced online volunteers will validate. So that's something else that can be done. Um, but online volunteering can be simple in organizations to support them in sense of um, admin work, um, like back-end office kind of thing, like um, procurement and management and all of that. So it's it's really a space where organizations can get a lot more out of um, the volunteer force. Thanks, Irit. I see uh, Tracy Dixon, you have your hand up. Please feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Thanks, Mark. Um, it's both an observation and a question. So in terms of the digital divide, I suppose a, a comment I would make is how many organisations use online recruitment for their volunteers? And therefore, if the, you know, given the digital divide, who is being excluded because of that online recruitment? So that could be low socioeconomic, it could be Indigenous, it could be uh, rural and remote, it could be uh, culturally linguistic diverse, it could be disability. So, you know, given all of those categories, who is excluded if we stick to an um, online recruitment process, which, you know, is terribly easy and, you know, again, working in the mega sport event area, they use it all the time because they're recruiting 70,000. So, you know, it, it's much easier than un opening envelopes all the time. The other request I would have is if anybody... Um, in response to my comments around with our paper around who's got a strategy for surviving and thriving mega sport events, both in terms of the impact if they are go expect to lose volunteers, but also if you're thinking that you can get a, a legacy from the, the events and increase your volunteering, and that could be in education, welfare, environment, doesn't have to be in sport or sport events. I'd really love to hear from you. So um, my email would be. It should be on the paper, I assume. I've forgotten. But, yeah, really would love to hear from you, to hear what you're doing, and, um, and maybe we can start a conversation around how best to, because, you know, I know that there's some research uh, soon to happen about trying to overcome the, uh, the volunteering barrier, barriers to volunteering for uh, Indigenous uh, people with disability and culturally and linguistic diverse. But I'd love to hear from anyone interested in, uh, telling a story about what you're doing to survive and thrive uh, the, the next decade of mega sport events in Australia. So thanks. Thanks, Tracy. Certainly, uh, I encourage anyone with uh, those experiences to get in contact with uh, with Tracy um, and uh, make contact. Um, I'll, I'll open for the um, for the first comment to the 
panel if there were any responses that anyone wanted to uh, put forward. If uh, if not, we might uh, move on to uh, to Gordon Hall. Your hand is raised. Um, take yourself off mute, mute and ask your question. Uh, Thank Gordon. you. The first one, one's a quick one um, in relation to some of the things that Melanie said. Um, when I was a director of the Fire and Emergency Service Authority, two of us tried to set up some road trash rescue volunteering in some of the desert areas. Unfortunately, it didn't go very well because of their cultural issues. When people get injured in a road accident or worse, of course, all sorts of things happen. So it's something we need to be aware in the volunteering in those areas is there's some cultural issues that we're not going to overcome very easy. I just want to say quickly, Mark, the other one, I'm going to go out in a bit of a gangplank here and I hope no one pushes me in too much anyway. My background's engineering. I actually come from the space industry. A lot of the people in the volunteering areas I'm in are, are engineering people, some superintendents for mines and things like that. Some of the documents uh, we've read seem to be more academics for academics in a way, and please don't take that the wrong way. Whereas we need to have, at the very start, um, we need to have a proper, what we feel, executive summaries and strategic overview over two or three pages so that people can read that. People who aren't doing this sort of thing all the time can actually read it and then understand where they're going and then try and break it down from there. I don't want to see any of these documents gather dust on the shelves, I can assure you. But I just ask that um, in doing that, if you can please seriously consider that. So those first two, three, four pages are done in simple, simple language, if I can use that phrase, so that different people can pick it up and actually have a good understanding of where they're going. The data in these documents is phenomenal and I think it's absolutely magic. The work of some of the people I've met doing it, it is great and we really need that. But to help it, we just need to break down a bit better so there's a good understanding at the start. I hope that makes sense. And I hope it doesn't offend any of you. Thank you. Thanks, Gordon. That's um, and I appreciate your um, your, your commentary um, on that in particular. Something we're very aware of, um, certainly at uh, Volunteer in Australia. And uh, and I'll acknowledge my my uh, colleagues from the state and territory peaks who are here. Uh, today, the the language, the accessibility, the inclusion that we take towards documentation is um, is really important, and it's certainly a focus for all of us within the uh, state and territory peak and the national peak area to improve um, that to to make things more accessible um, and uh, to to provide easier to read, oftentimes documentation, especially with things like national standards and others. Um, recognize that we've got some work to do there but there's certainly a commitment towards it and i appreciate you uh you uh putting that forward and, and, and raising that as an issue thank you um mark can i just jump in there it's melanie Please. here just in answer to gordon uh, take your point completely we actually did try to do this with these papers um so i'd be interested in feedback maybe offline um because we've we've uh, we, uh, we specifically asked academics to write in an easy um accessible style uh we have key point key insights so you know we 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 have actually in this series of papers really attempted to do that because there's no point in in operating in our own little bubble um but if if you feel that we haven't we still need to go further in that accessibility. Um, let me know because um, we we really were trying to make these papers, in particular, as accessible for everybody as possible. Thanks, Melanie. Uh, Jack, back to you. Um, yes, we do have a question here um, for Melanie that I thought was really interesting. Um, on the seven waves of volunteering. Uh, so Amanda's asked, what does the most current wave of volunteering look like? Uh, and what do you think are the broader, um, how the broader social context um, might shape what's happening in volunteering now? Oh, thank you for that question. Um, have to read this short paper. Uh, <laughs> but look, I can say that the challenges of our age, I think um, we have, uh, Sue Regan and I have suggested our climate our geography and the workplace. 
changes in the workplace. So um, I think we're all fully across that, that um, and we've heard some papers today, you know, already about climate, climate change. This We are in the midst of a particularly challenging time. Um, how we're going to address that um, the last time with the big floods, for example, in the 1950s, Governments got together and created a whole new service the S, called the SES. So this is a moment now where maybe that sort of thing has to happen. Uh, our geography is not really playing. It, it well, plays for and, for and against us. Um, and also workplace, workplace changes, I think, are also um, critical. Thanks, Melanie. Jack, do we have any other questions? Yes, we've got a question here. Um, this one's for Suihun from Tina. Um, how do the solutions mentioned in your research, Suihun, consider um, the issue of diversity? I think this is about diversity and inclusion. Uh, um, Tina, this, so this is, is fairly high level. So if you consider easy and you consider, I was talking to um, um, the members of the cult community in Tasmania recently. And so for them, something, if, if there is a language barrier, so, for instance, you know, recruitment uh, is in, in a language that they don't understand. It will not make it easy for them. If there's lots of red tape, it's not easy for the call communities. Um, and if, if you know, like online, some of them may not have access to internet and, and, and things like that. So that doesn't make things easy. So, so if we can overcome some of those things for the call community, that's that's kind of like in terms of easy. In terms of attractive, what attracts uh, people from different cultures uh, are different. So, you know, if if you have like something in black, some people from certain cultures will go, ah, I'm not going to go near that even. So, so, so what is attractive in different cultures is, is, is different. So again, we have to consider what's attractive to people from different cultures for diversity. For social, look, messenger, who is the messenger you use? Um, different communities have people that they different people that they respect, they look up to. So consider the messenger in your messaging. And then finally, timely. Well, um, I guess if you're going to run a recruitment campaign during Christmas, it will not work. If you are celebrating Christmas, if you're going to run a rec recruitment campaign during Eid, it's not going to help if you know the Muslims are celebrating. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that these four principles principles are fairly high level and you in your mind you think of the person that you want to apply it to, um, and and that's that's yeah, how you use them. I hope that answers the question. Thanks, sweetheart. Uh, Jack, if we have a couple more, we'll take two more questions and then we might uh, wrap it up. Yeah, uh, so I can see there's one more um, question we've got here, uh, which is actually from Melanie for uh, Megan, um, asking if there's a particular discipline that's dominating volunteering research um, and just to speak to some of the differences between disciplines uh, in influencing the direction of volunteering. I think uh, the pattern over the 10 years actually shows an increase in multidisciplinary teams and the recognition that they, that we shouldn't be working in silos. But the disciplines that are, are very obvious are sport, health, um, the corporate volunteering tends to come from business schools. Uh, but there are other areas, for example, archaeology was an area that um, there was work being done in. Of course, emergency services, there's a, a lot in that area as well. But I think the pattern over the last 10 years is the increase in cross-disciplinary or multidisciplinary research. And I think that's starting to draw some of the threads together, but it's not yet the case that we're, um, that we're all going in the same direction, and nor should we. I think that the different um, disciplinary differences actually um, assist in understanding of what's going on in the volunteering world. Wonderful. Thank you. Well, I think we are uh, drawing to a close. Um, Jack, stop me if I'm running over the top of another question, but um, I think, uh, is there one more or, or are we done? Uh, we might have time for one more question uh, that we just got in from Tracy, um, which was about regional communities, but also um, across Australia in general. Uh, how we're capturing changes from formal to informal volunteering. Um, I wondered if there was anyone who had picked up on that in their research. That might be a good question for the for the panel. If there's anything maybe from Megan's research or Melanie's on what's happening now in informal volunteering. 
If I can perhaps leap in, I think probably the most important thing is that the way that I searched meant that informal volunteering didn't necessarily come up because people don't always recognise it or label it as volunteering. Uh, But there is definitely a stream on rural volunteering and what's happening in rural communities. So it's it's a difficult question to answer directly, but it's certainly um, a stream of research that's quite prominent. Thank you. Uh, DJ, I see your hand is up. Why don't we take one question from you um, and then we'll uh, then we'll wrap. Thank you very much for the time, Mark, and I'm very uh, cognizant that we are almost out of time. So my quick question to all the researchers uh, was, has there any research been done linking activism and volunteering, given that, you know, some of the comments that I've heard today around, uh, you know, what are the major challenges that we are facing in the world that affect volunteering, whether geopolitical, whether climate, whether wars, there is, seems to be a, a huge movement in terms of activism, uh, especially amongst our youth to address our climate, um, you know, the, the catastrophe that is uh, going to happen unless we take radical action. And young people seem to be energized, um, marching, being active, joining groups like Extinction Rebellion. We rarely hear them referred to as volunteers. I am just wondering from a researcher point of view where that blockage might be in terms of definitions. I'm happy to just to jump in there quickly and say I always include activism, um, particularly activism that occurs within a group, um, and I always have done in my historical research. I can't see the difference whether, you know, and so even if they don't identify as volunteers, um, that is, in fact, what they're, do, what, you know, what they're doing. So I personally um, have always seen activism as part and parcel of the volunteering sector. Thanks, Melanie. Friends? We have a couple of minutes. Let me wrap it up by firstly thanking the researchers. Uh, it's a privilege to deal with the uh, the minds and the insights um, who have joined us today. I encourage you to go to the National Strategy for Volunteering website. The papers are live. Um, immerse yourself in them. There's some brilliant thinking. There are some phenomenal insights. As I said uh, at the beginning, this is tranche two of the uh, volunteer research paper initiative. There will be one more tranche um, and uh, we'll be uh, we'll be doing a, a session very similar to this one. Um, I'll also remind you that feedback is still open for the National Strategy for Volunteering um, draft framework um, and jump onto the website. Uh, enter your, uh, your thoughts into that. Uh, we're keen to hear as we move towards a conclusion for that. Uh, finally, um, it's been a joy to have you with us uh, this afternoon. I encourage you and welcome you to Canberra for next year. National Volunteering Conference, the first since 2018, will be held on the 13th and the 14th of February next year. 14th of February, of course, Valentine's Day. Volunteering is all about love. Come and join us uh, in Canberra. Uh, it's going to be great. Um, we will be launching the National Strategy for Volunteering at the National Volunteering Conference. So please jump online, grab the tickets, early bird pricing, cheapest tickets you'll see, best show in town. Um, look forward to seeing you for that. Um, enjoy the remainder of your day. Thanks so much.